I have been discussing uh, the UK, uh, Ukraine crisis with my constituents and a number of Indiana media outlets uh, for the last few days, and virtually every interview or conversation on the subject includes early on this question. What difference does this make to us here in Indiana? What, uh, what American interests are at stake? And these are legitimate questions, and they deserve an answer. Because before we commit America to address potential conflicts, we need to describe and define just what is our interest and why should we be engaged. Now, in this conflict, we're not talking about the use of military force, but other we are thinking about and talking about and should be examining other measures that can influence the outcome of a crisis situation that could have significant consequences for the American people. If we can't answer that question and we can't address that with a, with a uh, compelling answer, uh, then we shouldn't get engaged. But if we can determine a compelling answer and reason why we should engage in some form, then we need to make sure the American people know why it is we're doing this and why this is important. Ukraine is 5,000 miles away. Trade between our two countries is minuscule and shrinking. Only 30% of the Ukrainian population shares our Christian faith or identifies with any faith. And Ukraine is a source of no energy or crucial materials. Uh, indeed, the country is a source of instability and corruption. So why should Americans and Hoosiers care about what's happening to a country 5,000 miles away? Well, let me suggest some reasons and then perhaps some suggestions as to what would be the best way for us to help influence this crisis situation in a way that's positive for our country and, frankly, for Western democracy and, frankly, for the world. The first and most obvious reason we should take this seriously is the central lesson of history. Conflicts, even catastrophes, sometimes grow from small beginnings. Most know that the assassination of an imperial relative in a Balkan town in 1914 led to the death by violence of 37 million people, World War I. We also know that the uh, cataclysm of World War II began with the stealth invasion of Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. And despite warnings as to what this might lead to, we saw the tragic loss of tens of millions of people in World War II. This sort of is uh, eerily reminiscent of Russia's moves on Crimea last week. But a history lesson closer in time is taught by the Balkan Wars of the 90s when Serb gunboats shelled Dubrovnik, a Croatian city, in 1992. The world, and most especially Croatia's European neighbors, did exactly nothing. Our own Secretary of State said repeatedly that there were no American interests at stake. Before that view was changed and NATO eventually intervened three years later, more than 100,000 people had been slaughtered. So if the international community had had the collective wisdom, leadership, and frankly, courage or guts to simply tell Belgrade that civilian European population centers are no longer shelled in modern Europe, all that suffering could have been prevented and our own armed forces could have stayed in their barracks and in their homes. So we should draw lessons, or we should draw from lessons, uh, the, such lessons that we need to, to not confront Later, the question of whether or not we should intervene militarily in a Ukrainian civil war or a war between Ukraine and Russia. Instead, we must confront now the choice we have of doing nothing and letting Putin have his way or lead an American and an international response to impose penalties on Putin's Russia so that he comes to his senses. Now, a second and related American interest is in the stability of the European continent itself. Ukraine is not an obscure sideshow. It is comprised of remnants of two European empires and deeply embedded 
in the integrated structure, identity, economy, and culture of Europe as a whole. Disaster there threatens a very great deal in Europe, a continent that we have spent a hundred years, trillions of dollars, and hundreds of thousands of lives to stabilize. European security and stability have been at the very heart of our foreign and defense policy for an entire century. If American foreign policy and American strategic interests in the world have any permanent core, it is that interest in Europe's well-being. Now, Ukraine's conflict with the remnants of Soviet-style aggression pretends serious threats to the rest of Russia's borderlands, nearly all of which was long dominated by Red Army presence and force. The Baltic states must be alarmed right now. If we do nothing, they could panic. Poland has already summoned NATO councils to consider consequences for its own security and therefore for the security of the alliance. Georgia painfully reflects that the paltry international response to its own war with Russia five years ago surely emboldened Putin in this latest adventure. In other words, we could be looking at a, Sud a Sudetenland moment. We hope that is not the case. It is no secret, though, that Putin has imperial ambitions, motivated by his pathological insecurities and a quest to restore lost glories. These are dangerous delusions that, if not confronted firmly, could come to threaten us all. Beyond history and beyond the threats to continental security and stability, I am even more concerned about America's place in the world and how inaction will further harm it. Abroad, we are increasingly seen as a spent force, exhausted by interminable wars, politically divided and inert, financially strained and floundering without firm, articulate, determined leadership. This is a bleak, incomplete picture of my country that more than anything else makes me determined to be part of an effort to correct this perception of America. In many ways, we could potentially look at the Ukrainian crisis as an opportunity. We have a chance now to summon our collective will and impose costs for Putin's irresponsible behavior. We have many robust capabilities to reward those who join us in responsible, mutually productive cooperation in managing world affairs and in punishing those who do not. This is the moment to demonstrate our return to the leadership role the realities of this harsh world have long imposed upon us. This situation, this crisis which we now face in Ukraine can be a moment to demonstrate our return to a leadership role desperately needed by this tortured world where the realities of this harsh world have long imposed upon us. So it is in our national interest, in my opinion, to lead the world toward solutions that we know are best for us all. No other country can manage it. We've seen that. And without that management, we risk things that could harm us in many, many ways and continue to undermine our role in this world in providing for peace and stability. For these reasons, I am tomorrow introducing a sense of the Senate resolution articulating some of the steps that I think we and the President together should consider. None of these involve military force or the preparation for using such force. Now is not the time to add to the violence, but rather to remove the use of force by all parties as an option. I hope the resolution will contribute to the search for both a bipartisan, unified government approach to problem solving and an international consensus on firm actions that will change Russia's behavior. I'm saying, Mr. President, we should stand united as Americans with a single message and a single voice led by our leader that shows there we are resolute in standing together with hopefully our European allies and others that want to join us in condemning the actions taken by 
Putin and Russia, and in offering and proposing meaningful sanctions and measures that will bring the reality of Russia's actions right straight to Putin's desk and hopefully cause him to rethink this strategy. The resolution will commit the Senate to work urgently with the President to identify a package of economic sanctions and other measures to compel Putin to remove his armed forces from Ukrainian territory and return that territory to full Ukrainian sovereign control. Further, I will suggest that we construct a complete, comprehensive plan to isolate Putin's Russia from the community of nations. We seek a consensus on such a plan with our friends and allies, everyone who wants to see a sovereign Ukraine, secure within its own borders, able to seek its own destiny on its own terms. That is the right of every sovereign nation. My resolution will also call upon the President to consider a number of measures to isolate and sanction Russia. We could reschedule a meeting of the G8 nations to take place as soon as possible, at which meeting the participating nations should seriously consider a U.S. proposal to formally expel Russia. The United States should propose to NATO that the alliance immediately suspend operation of Russia of the Russia NATO Council. The Russian military and diplomatic representation at NATO should be expelled. A close relationship with Russia, uh, Russia's defense officials during a time when that country has invaded and occupied a neighbor contravenes the founding purpose of NATO. How can we possibly meet on a Russia-NATO council basis when Russia has invaded and occupied a neighbor? The President could ask for leadership of FIFA to reconsider its decision to place World Cup 2018 matches in Russia and instead award these games to a more worthy alternative country. Russia is just celebrating the Sochi Olympics. I think we got the real measure of President Putin, former KGB director, as to uh, what his real intentions are. Um, it's not to bring more goodwill toward Russia and more confidence in that country. The United States could work with other members of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, to deploy monitors in Ukraine to help confirm that the security of the Russian-speaking population is not threatened. This pretext for Russian aggression must be removed to international satisfaction. Senate leadership could dispatch a congressional delegation led by OSCE commissioners to visit Ukraine and bolster OSCE's involvement in addressing this crisis. Another option would be the United States working with the OSCE and German Chancellor Angela Merkel to support her proposal to create an OSCE contact group to pursue dispute resolution and mediate direct negotiations between the Ukrainian and Russian governments. The United States should not maintain the current status of diplomatic relations with Russia at current levels. We could downgrade our diplomatic representation while, remain, while retaining its efficacy by announcing that we will not be sending our new ambassador to Moscow. We could, we could instead dispatch an experienced professional diplomat to Ukraine to serve as chargé d'affaires to handle the crisis. We could also reduce our diplomatic presence to focus exclusively on crisis management, not business as usual. We could close our consulates general uh, and require Russia to make reciprocal steps to close their consulates in the U.S. We in Congress should, I believe, expand the Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act to sanction the Ministry of Defense officials in the chain of command responsible for this invasion, Duma leadership responsible for rubber stamping it, and Crimean officials complicit in its execution. The United States could also address sanctions that might serve to convince more segments of the Russian population that their government is taking irresponsible steps contrary to the people's interests. To this end, we should suspend and could suspend Russian eligibility for H-2B temporary or seasonable work visas. Mr. President, this is just a, a, a menu of suggestions, actions that we could take, actions that I think would impose upon Russia uh, a cost 
for their brazen attempt to intercede in the affairs of a sovereign nation to under a, the most flimsy of, uh, flimsiest of pretenses uh, invade a country under the pretext that its citizens there uh, or those who favored support for Russia were under some type of lethal threat. That is not the case, has not been demonstrated, has not been proven. Now is the time to act, to act quickly and act together. Our leverage is our leadership. We need to take that up, uh, take, we need to take up that powerful tool and show Putin that he has misjudged us. Now is the time for the U.S. to reassert its leadership in the world by taking direct action. Not, by, not through military action, but through a menu of measures designed to bring Russia to its senses and designed to protect the sovereign interests of those nations that are seeking to align with the West in a democratic way. We need that leadership from the President. We need that support from this Congress in a bipartisan measure. And we need to speak with a united voice hopefully with our European partners and others throughout the Western world and the free world, to send a message that Russia cannot ignore and to impose a measure of costs that will impact that country's economy and impact the decision that has to be made by their president. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call.